Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Instructor Phil Dimitratis and um, I want to show an awesome technique that I was really lucky to learn back in the day for my uh, basic drawing for entertainment arts class because uh, I have some students that don't know this technique and I want them to know it. This is a technique right here uh, with this little wonderful pencil right here. It is a Sanford Prismacolor. Okay, let me see if I can bring that up. Um, it comes in multiple colors. This one is an indigo blue. I don't know if the camera's going to focus on that. That's an indigo blue. Um, they make them in a variety of different colors. There's only a couple colors I really like or prefer. You could buy the whole pack to sketch what to sketch with. That's up to you. This is a non-photo blue. Okay, but for right now, um, for my class, I think the greatest option that you can use is just start off. You can buy just a couple of the black Prismacolor pencils. They look like this, okay? Or you can buy them in indigo blue and they both they both work very well, okay? So what I thought I'd do is what this, this medium entails is using tracing paper. So this is a really simple Canson. No, Canson's not paying me for this. They could though. Canson tracing paper pad. This is tracing paper, okay? Listen as the camera focuses, okay? Tracing paper is very um, thin and it does come in different formats. I do like Canson, it has sort of a nice plastic feel to it. It is a good brand, okay? All right, outside of, outside of that, there is another brand that I'm gonna cover really quick with you. This brand is called Utrecht, which um, has been bought out by Dick Blick. Utrecht is a Dutch company that used to make fabrics, paper, and all kinds of good stuff. Um, I really like this paper a lot. Um, and what I like about it, some of the other pads might say, this says standard weight down here on the bottom. Okay, some of the other pads might say um, uh, lightweight, medium weight, heavy weight. I think it, the best thing to get is a medium weight or standard weight. I would not get the lightweight unless you're doing really crappy traceovers and you don't care about the paper. So the reason why this says rough only pad is because um, this was exposed to some moisture and I want to show you what happens when this is exposed, exposed to moisture. So let the camera zoom in there. Can you see the buckle here and how it almost sticks together? right here in this little section. Sorry, the camera's sort of focusing there. Let me pull it up apart. And you see how it sticks together and it stays sort of crumply? Let me bring that a little bit. The camera's having a hard time sort of focusing here, probably because of all the, the LED lights I have on, which is okay. So um, this is what happens. This is why I have rough only pad because I got this pad wet, okay? So speaking of that, hold on, let me grab something else. If you have naturally clammy hands, which a lot of people do, I do, being Greek and Mediterranean and all, I have one of these cool little Cintiq gloves that fit on like this. And sometimes I have wore these before when I'm drawing and working on tracing paper, okay? Because it's quite nice and it allows my perspiration to go into my hand and it's not coming off my knuckle. So what does happen, I've noticed when I work, is a lot of times my knuckle right here, actually, I might sound gross, but I get a little bit of like a callus right there because I'm drawing so much and that's the part of my hand. If you look, I have a little bump right there on my pinky. That's the part of my hand that's sliding around all the time on, on my sketchbook, on pads, on everything. Okay, so um, this is what I would recommend. And then for my students, I told them a good size to get is this size right here. This is the Utrecht, if you look around. I don't know if they make this exact one because I bought them in a big box. When I bought them, it's the Utrecht standard weight 11 by 14. I think this is a great size because it's great when you turn it horizontally. You can do a lot of rough sketches. You can have a lot of fun with it. You can get a lot of cool stuff on there. It works fantastically, okay? So I really like that size. I also have it, they make it in a smaller size right here, which is nine by 12. I use that sometimes as an overlay. And then every now and then, depending what kind of project I'm on, I will even, I even have it, I purchased it in a 14 by 17 size as well. So it just depends what I'm working on. Now, uh, a step up from this tracing paper that's actually about 10 times more expensive is this right here. I just wanna show it to you. It's orange, let the camera focus, magic. It's orange clear cut design vellum, okay? Now this is really expensive. This is between 30 to $35, but only for 50 sheets, okay? So it's this really thick, heavy 
uh, vellum that has much more of a white opacity to it. And what that does is it really reacts well with uh, Prismacolor pencil. But I do prefer tracing paper. Okay, with that said and done, now what I want to do is I'm talking about how important this stuff is. I thought I would show you a bunch of work that I've done over the years. Okay, so this is how important this work is to me. Um, working in this this medium, okay, and especially the Prismacolor pencil. So these are sketches from one of my sketchbooks that I have. This is Prismacolor pencil on tracing paper, and also I found back in the day like a sheeny white hammer mill paper that works just as well, okay. Uh, the tracing paper, uh, excuse me, Prismacolor pencil works just as well on tracing paper, but the downfall of going onto the hammer mill is you can't erase. On tracing paper, you can do a full erase, no problem. But I just thought I'd go through some of this work because I want to show you guys stuff that I've done. So I pre, I um, once I was on another pad of heavyweight tracing paper, and then what I did is I went back and I hit it with markers after I hit uh, pencil like this and hit it with line. And so the sketching, the thumbnails, it's just a fantastic all-around paper. And then even when it comes to industry work, back in the day, now here's the change out of why I value this tech unique so much and why it's also sort of disappeared and that is is because people have gone digital okay and going digital there's nothing wrong with it but there's something that was really really wonderful about the way Prismacolor works and the way the drag of the pencil happens I mean this pencil in multiple colors when you drag this on certain type of paper whether it be smooth rough whatever it gives you a wonderful feel so here's some work from Adam Sandler's eight crazy night movies I just happen to come across a bunch of old things here here's some location designs that I did back in the day for the Pirates movie um, at, at Big Idea okay and then, of course, here's some character design that I also did on that project as well, a couple of passes. And then I also came across, this is good old VeggieTales stuff. This house was all drawn in Prismacolor, and then I scanned it in and I worked in Photoshop. So, aha, maybe that just touches on something right there. This is such a great technique, and it's so reliable. It's one of my favorite all-time techniques for doing line cleanup and then going back over, scanning my line in, and then working in Photoshop. I really feel... I have more sensitivity with this technique than I do when I'm working with um, uh, other pencil or even digital material at times. So I really still do enjoy this. And also I got to mention this and give a shout out to the character design world because people in the character design world still love working with Prismacolor pencil and working with tracing paper is just an absolute 100% unbeatable technique that is just, you know, to be awesome for, you know. So all of this work here, this is some work I did here for Real Effect Studios, um, working on a G.I. Joe DVD project. This is uh, some of Cobra's base design. So all of this here was done. The only difference is, is I scanned, printed this, and organized this on an old portfolio page showing part of my process. But this is the work that I turned into Real Effects that was relevant to their show design and show production, okay? And all of it was done with Prismacolor Pencil. So one of the golden things about Prismacolor Pencil, number one, it gets to pure black and it gets to pure white. So it has a great gradient match going from light all the way into darks. The other thing, it's really easy to erase and pull out your high right, highlights. You can go all the way down to the base volume of the paper. The other thing down here, like doing oceans and whatnot, it smudges very easily and it's very artistic friendly. So with that in mind, it, it, it's a great way to, to produce comps and tonals that's very effective. And what's funny is I've heard a couple students that make comments like, I can't afford a $2,000 computer and I can't get a Cintiq and me, 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 me. And it's like, okay, um, you don't need all of that. What you need for, you know, what, 12 bucks, $11, a pad of good old fashioned tracing paper and some black Prismacolor pencils and you are good to go. So the other thing I really like about Prismacolor pencils is these are roughs. These are roughs I did, a big idea, and it just has a nice smoothability, a nice funness. The way you can smear it, build it up, push it back down, it's just a fantastic medium, and it's probably one of my all-time favorites. So again, here's some more work from Real Effects. Okay, you get to see, it's just, it's fun, it's easy, it's great to work in. I just love everything about it. This is also a Prismacolor pencil. This is a line cleanup. So I wanted to show you how tight your line can get, you know, you have to sharpen the pencil a little bit. Now, I hope Prismacolor is out there listening because there have been some co complaints about some of their quality control. Because over the past couple 
years, there's been a changeover in the company and how they process some of their pencils. One of the things I've noticed is some of the uh, distribution companies that are selling Prismacolor pencils might drop their product sometimes. So you get them, you go to sharpen them, and they break. The other part of that problem is that you need a really good sharpener. The best sharpeners in the world, still in my opinion, are the Panasonic Auto Stop sharp Sharpeners, which they don't make anymore and can be hard to get. Okay, there are some other good companies, but keeping the Prismacolor to a nice fine tip, look at that beautiful line quality that I got in there. Let me just bring that a little bit closer. Look at the thick and thin quality. That looks like it's cleaned up in Illustrator, but it's not. That's Prismacolor, folks. Okay, absolutely fantastic. That was a, a pitch for the wonderful and awesome, that's an environment for the awesome Tom Bancroft on the show that he was working on. Okay. Um, here's another, this is again a tonal comp on tracing paper that I did for another project that since way gone, here's a copy of one of the images that I did. So even if we're doing characters, really quick rough comps, the story, absolutely fantastic technique, okay? And then even going into a realistic form, here's some character stuff that I did with it, you know? Coming up, I did this stuff is a little bit older. I even showed one of my students back in the day, look, I took my eraser right here and I just went like this. This, by the way, is a Sakura Japanese electric eraser. These are a little pricey. They're about 50 bucks. If you look around now, you can get them for a lot cheaper. You don't have to get them for 50. Okay. So do you see how I just erased that right there? So what I'm going to do, this is how easy it is. I've gone down to the pure white of the paper. This is a great thing about this technique. I can come back in here. I can darken part of that line where it just was. I can take the side of my pencil, lightly smooth it in like this. And then what I can do is come back and take a awesome, very hard to find, luxurious, simple Kleenex like so. Okay. And then I just rub and smear. And the secret is, is if I put a little bit of that value down, what was there before, and I smudge it, you can see what happens is it literally blends right in. You see that? Part of the foot goes right back. Now, whenever you smudge with Prisma, it does knock the value back down. So then I come back, I punch that up a little bit. Then I can come over here, take my eraser, put a nice crisp highlight right over there. And it's like nothing ever happened. That's what I love about this technique. It's absolutely just, it's beautiful. It's forgiving. It has a great feel for drawing. By the way, um, you'll notice here's my little art bag. I bought this a long time ago in Morocco when I was backpacking. And then this is for black Prismacolors. This one here is my blue Prismacolor. One thing I'm going to give you a recommendation if you start working in this, get a separate kneaded eraser because it does pick up. So look at the difference here. Look at that. Black eraser, blue eraser. So you don't want to be working in blue and then go to black and bring it back and forth on that paper. It does pick up the pigment and it will, it will, excuse me, smear that pigment back into the color so uh, of that paper. So it's really important. I only use black when working in black. I only use blue when working in blue. Okay, that's a little personal note there, right? You don't want to have to learn the hard way. You have a cool drawing you did of a creature. Now, what's really cool about this, to me, this is like a rough pounce. So I can go over this again. I could pull out line. I can show this is a rough concept. And believe it or not, this design here didn't take me a ton of time, folks. This With this technique, that's the thing about Prisma that's so wonderful. It's very fast and it's very expedited. So you can crank something out like this in about anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, depending on how much detail you want to put in. And then, of course, here's the great thing about why I'm stressing about why I love this so much. Excuse me as I step away from the mic. Look, imagine if I come over here, I take my drawing, I open up my tracing paper pad, and look at what happens. Boom. See that? I can see on top of it. It's like it never even left. I can come back here and clean up my line. That's the beauty of this paper. You see, it's, it's a portable light table. Okay, so you can get in here and push your values. You can smear, you can get dark delights. I can come back on this and an average cleanup in relation to about this size and Prismacolor would probably take me in the neighborhood of about, um, I'm going to guess about 15 to 25 minutes depending on the detail. Okay, and then when that's done, I can scan that into Photoshop and start painting on it. That's why I love this technique so much. And that's why I want my students involved with this technique. Okay, so without a doubt, sorry as I roll back away, when I tell you guys this technique changed my, my life, it did. And I got to give ownership. I learned this technique from two people. I learned it from actually three people. I learned it from Michael Spooner. I learned it from Paul Felix. 
And then I learned it from Robert St. Pierre, who also learned it from Michael Spooner back in the day from taking classes with them. Okay. This is non photo blue. What's cool about non photo blue Prismacolor is that it really doesn't Xerox. So you can, now I will pick up a little bit or it doesn't, this will scan, but it won't Xerox. But then I could go over this with a black. So these are some toy comps I did from back in the day when I was working on some, uh, on a family friendly show. And these are some little sketches that I did of vehicles. And yes, they're trying to rip off cars. Don't ask. Hey, you could pay me what you want me to do. I'm more than happy to sketch, but I just thought I'd pull these out of my little archive drawer and I thought I'd show them to you. Okay, so again, fantastic technique for sketching. And even way back in the day, I came across this but ugly old page I did for character design before I had taken classes. But again, it's Prismacolor pencil. And I don't like a lot of these designs, but I, I thought I'd show it to you because it is a stepping stone of me getting better and understanding more about shape language and how to draw. But look at how fun it is, even on a nice thick piece of paper. So Prismacolor works on about anything. Okay, with that said and done, Give me one second and I want to show you one of the main reasons why I thoroughly love this pencil so much. Okay, so this is why. Okay, this right here is a real rough that I did. I'm going to sketch for you in just a second. This right here is super rough. Do you see that? There's not, there's a lot of broken up lines. And what I did is I came back on this technique when I was working and I took, uh oh, is that black or blue? Oops. Let's keep the blue in the blue pile and keep the block in the black pile. Okay, cool. So I came back on here like so and I smudge along and you can see how easy it is. Once I get something down there, I just take my wonderful expensive Kleenex here and boom, I smudge it along and it's just down. Okay, so what's really cool and effective is I can show somebody an image like this very fast. It's just simple rough. But then look at how cool this is. A lot. I take another piece of tracing paper, I put it over on the top like this, and I went over that box, and you see what happens? I just take my time and I go thick to thin line. So basic fundamentals of draftsmanship and contour line. I go thick line on like an outside, sort of here, I'll draw it over here where you can see it a little bit more. I might have a line that's sort of coming down that goes a little bit thicker, and then I might pick up the pencil, turn a little bit, go thinner, then press down and go thicker again. That nice thick to thin line quality really picks up fantastically. And the result is once you pull away your rough and you put your drawing down, you see that? Look at how pretty that is. Gosh darn, that's pretty, right? I mean, it is. It look all those nice thick and thin lines. And you know what's funny is that now you can finally get that in, in Photoshop, but there was a while um, where you didn't have enough brush presets with transfer settings to be able to get you that type of thick and thin line. But you know what's funny is that I still like to work this way. Maybe it's just the way I grew up with it. Look, I'm erasing that line that's right there. Boom. See that? Now, I press down pretty hard, and most of it comes up a little bit still there. But still, that's pretty good that I can get most of that down. Okay? So that's the purpose of this. Okay? Is it for my class, they're going to have to design some props for the front of a particular storefront. Your goal is to be sketching with this paper and to be working very loose and rough like this. Okay, then what we're going to go back and do is if you wanted to, we could do two things. You could clean up your work like this and just have that in a portfolio and you could take that into Photoshop and paint on top of it. And that would be one of your, uh, that would be an example of a nice line paint done in Photoshop. Okay. All right, so let me stop the recording here. I showed your work, and I'm going to start sketching a couple of really simple basic props and talk about the wonderful feel and the do's and don'ts of this technique. So we'll be right back. All right, so let me teach you rule number one when you get a tracing paper pad, okay? Rule number one that you want to do is you're going to be folding over this binding a lot, okay? Sorry, I have some old rough sketches in here that... From back in the day, goofing around. I know you're like, don't throw them away. I got so many of these damn things. Anyway, so this is what we're going to do. All right. So look, I have this. What you're going to do is about an inch and a half before the cover. You're going to take it and fold it like this. Let me turn it sideways. And you're going to put a crease in the paper like this. I did a little bit larger there. You can be about an inch is fine. Okay. And you're going to do that. The reason why, There's a reason why we do that. Then you're going to take... Uh, trusty done, you know, a pen or pencil. You're going to rub along that edge and flatten down that, that corner like that. So you're going to have a crease inside there. 
There's a reason why we do that. The reason is, is on the ends of the tracing paper pad, when you go to flip over your pad like so, see what happens now? This little bow doesn't put as much pressure on the glued binding that's there. When you don't do that, this, let me show you what happens, that starts to bend and the binding puts a tremendous amount of pressure on there. The glue comes undone and then all your tracing paper comes out, which isn't fun. Okay, so let's talk about the base supplies that we need for this subject matter, which I've already covered inside the class. I listed it on the class blog, but I'm going to go ahead and show you again anyway. Supply number one, okay, is obviously you need the pencil, Prismacolor pencil, okay? That's great. Supply number two that you can get is you can get a Pentel extendable eraser like so, and it comes out and they're flexible, okay? All right, or I even happen to have another version of that made by Statler, awesome German company that makes great stuff. Okay, that'll work. Okay, another supply you need is your trusty handy dandy um, uh, kneaded eraser, okay? Separate for that particular color, all right? Now, sometimes when I'm working, I like having a small polymer eraser. They come in handy. Statler also makes a small polymer eraser. Excuse me while I look up. I'm looking at my art desk to see if I have one floating around. I keep them in different places, so I don't happen to have one with me right now, but you guys know what that is. Okay, all right. And another handy dandy element you can have right here is a pencil extender because what happens is when your pencils do get down, it is great, you don't throw them away and you put a little pencil extender on them. Now this right here, what I've done here is, I don't know if you could see that, I've shaved, shaved off a little bit of the wood off of that so I can fit a, that's a polymer Pentel. So this eraser tip is the same type of eraser that's that. I don't use these, these are pink pearl right here. These sort of suck on tracing paper, they pick up too much, but I use them on other types of drawing paper, okay? So what I do use is that right there, okay? Hold on, and then of course, to get really high tech into this if you want, these are fantastic use. This is a tough stuff, white extendable eraser tip, and what's great about this is it has a much thinner eraser, and the reason why we use this and we use this right here. So I'm gonna pull away this other stuff, which is sort of the common sense, and we're gonna talk about these for a minute. The reason why I use these is because of this. If you take your X-Acto knife, okay, and if you take this right here, your eraser, and if we pull out our X-Acto knife, what'll happen is that we can hold this up to the end of our eraser like this. See that? And we chop off the end, and it's a nice, smooth, extremely crisp line on there. We can do the same thing with this. If I take this and I hold this eraser at a little bit of an angle, and if I chop with that and lightly press through, it'll give me a nice sharp edge on that eraser that acts as a wedge-based tool for erasing. That is really, really handy when you get down to doing details. So an X-Acto knife is also another tool to use. Okay, all right, with that said and done, Give me one second here. Let me put that trusty. By the way, always put your X-Acto knife in like that. Okay, I'll tell you why. One day, a long time ago, when I was working at MGM, I thought I was a genius by having my X-Acto like this, and I used to have a cork on it. One day, I had it in my pencil jar, and the cork had came off, and I went reaching for a pencil, and my arm came across and hit right here, and went and if, I don't know if you can see it anymore, but I had a huge giant line right through here in the base of my hand. And actually, let me show it to you, it's right here. It goes from here all the way back down to there. Because I was reaching, I was drawing with my right hand, I reached with my left hand to grab something, and what do you know, I sliced it right open. So that was not good times. So note to self, I always flip that guy upside down like that when I'm, I'm you know, moving it around. And then I also put the little plastic case on it because sitting in an emergency room to get stitches sucks. Okay, um, so that's basically it. The only other thing I could think of that I wanted to show you is, this is something I picked up from good old Michael, is sometimes I come across, you'll see this pencil I have here, there's no tip on it. I don't use this pencil for drawing. What I do use is the tip of the eraser. So I'll come in and I'll use that eraser as a wedge tool to come in and erase something. And then if I'm working, I can then also take this and chop this off. This can last. Now, let me show you. The tip of this right now, it's hard. So if I go to erase, see what it does? 
it's orange dust and it leaves a nasty mark. Once a standard pencil eraser gets a little hardened from just air and whatever, it's no longer good and you can't use that anymore and then you have to go back. That's what I like about these wonderful little polymer tipped erasers here is they last a long time and if you want to clean them, all you got to do is sort of rub them with your fingers and it comes right off. Then the last thing you need most importantly is this, a good old hairbrush. The hairbrush allows you to get in there and just push off some basics, okay? All right, so with that said and done, let's start some sketching because I want to show you how wonderful and rough and loose this is and how you should treat this technique because students get in there sometimes and they're actually a little intimidated by part of it. Give me one second. I'm bringing out my trusty kneaded eraser and I want to make sure there's two little ways that I like to draw and I'm going to mention that to you real fast before I start drawing here. Okay. So let me put these back. Cool. We are ready to go. All right. So first things first, um, you'll notice when I like to sketch, I have this pen that has more of a up to a fine point on it. This one's a little bit more medium point, and this one is a flat, um, excuse me, this is more of a shiny point like this, okay? I thought I had a real dull one. I didn't. I'm going to turn it dull. I really like dull points, okay, for a couple of reasons. All right, so when I go to sketch, so I'm going to start working on some props I'm thinking of right now for my class. So I'm going to pr pretend I'm just working on some different crates, okay? The great thing about this is as I'm sketching, you just got to get the feel of what it feels like. If it if it's it's just nice, it's loose, it's fun. I'm just thinking up in my head, I'm gonna make some type of a fish crate, let's say. So maybe I have some type of a weird logo here, I don't know yet. Okay, so I'm gonna come in here, and then maybe on the side of this I have two little pieces of wood like so. making sure my angles are sort of matching up here. Okay, and then I'm gonna come in, and so where this joins here, what I did is I made this one piece of wood here, and then I put like boards overlapping a little bit. So uh, you'll notice I out of habit I went to erase, and I realized, hey, I can't erase because I don't have a tip on here. So I'm gonna put this little polymer tip, even though it's, you know, I shouldn't put that one. Let me grab another one real quick. Actually, they're in my other bag, so I'm not going to bother going into all that. So I'm just going to use this right now. I could use a good old kneaded eraser, okay? Anyway, that's fine. I was going to do something that's not that important. So here, I'm going to come back, bring the other back of this in, like this. I'm going to end that off. It's making like a little board here. and That's going to end about here. And then as I bring that piece of wood down, I'm going to have this other these others. So that's one plank and I'm going to have a little like a nail guy in there, maybe a little nail in there that's holding these boards on. Okay. And it's okay to make mistakes with this. I mean, it's, it's like if you did something like right there, I touched those two ends together. It's no big deal. I just come back here. Look at that. Boom. It's done. I just erased it. I go like that. It's gone. Okay. So I went Real quick, pause the video. I grabbed one of my nice brand new white little Pentel guys here because I just want to show you how easy it is. Look at that. Boom. You go over a line. You didn't mean to get it. It just comes right off. There's no issues here. The reason why I don't like doing this too much with my hand is that it smudges the paper. So if it smudges the paper, i got to come back here later and i got to clean it up with my needed. That's what I like about using this hairbrush. It's quick and easy. Everyone should have a hairbrush. still use it to this day when I'm sketching on my sketchbook. And doing stuff all the time it's fantastic okay so here we go we get these base shapes in here okay and then let's come over here to this side i'm going to get the top board like i have there so maybe the board comes over here it goes over a little bit that board's going to come there it's going to drop in and then i might have another piece of that board that comes in about there okay so that's it that might be one crate i'm going to do and you know i might look at part of my drawing i'm like hey i'm going to see this underlying line that connects to there i'm going to draw through my drawing and then i'm going to come in here throw a couple lines in there like so. This is wood. So, you know, on this pattern, even if it's super rough, I might throw some wood lines in there just to see how it, it feels. You know, maybe you have a little bit of a wood line that comes in like this on top of that piece. Okay. 
And the great thing about this is you just stay rough. You just have fun. You just... And, and you got to get in there and not worry about anything. Just don't be so... Look at me. I'm just sort of pressing down. That might be wood grain, whatever. Look, it's just fun. You know, it's... Gosh, it makes it so enjoyable. There's just a drag that happens on this paper. So look at that. That's a rough sketch for me, right? So let's do something now that's even has a lot more of a rough consistency than that, okay? So let's do a lantern of some type. So I'm gonna think of some lantern. Start with like a base circle here, and there might be an ellipse to the base of this. This might come down a little bit. There we go, so that may be part of the base. Now. I want to throw this off a little bit so it's not so perfect. So I want to show you how I can come back and fix something that I'm drawing easily. Okay. I don't know. Let's just... I'm not really looking at any reference. I'm just making something up real quick. Let's just say... There's a glass part like this in here. And then maybe there's... A line wire, one of those wires that comes over and wraps over the glass. Maybe there's one of these little thingies that stick out. And here. Okay, and then I might come in here and be like, okay, there might be a little bit of a trim to that, like another edge on the bottom there. Through my shape. That curve coming in, like so, okay. And then maybe let's pay. Uh, maybe there's a top part here. Sort of making this up. Not really looking at any reference right now, right? On the back side, there'll be a circle there. So maybe then there's a. I don't know. Maybe there's a skinny like handle. Sort of comes back in this direction. that okay boom that's it try to keep it loose friendly let's have fun with it you know and let's see here I'm trying to think what other kind of props I might want to throw in there um yeah I'm just maybe I have to have a, a treasure chest of some kind start with the base shape that's what we always want to do right talked about that already in the basic drawing for entertainment arts class, right? We always draw through our shapes to find to the other side. And then we start carving our shapes up and we find center lines. We match things up, we come back down. We find where our objects are making sense. And then if we draw through, we can find the other side to objects like so. That way we know exactly how they're, they're sort of working. Okay. So I get that curve in there. Come back over here. And again, one of the reasons I draw through that shape is that I want to know where that is. That point right there determines how I draw through part of my shape. I have to understand that curve in there to get the right curve going from here to about there. Okay, so once I get that in, that's perfect, right? So I know exactly how it's going to be. That's going to be sort of the top. Okay, this is going to be the lid. Now I can go on, now that I have the shape that's working, now I can get in there and I can put some detail in there. So I can come back in here, I can drop a line coming down this way, drop a line that comes like this, and then maybe there's a little bit of... Now you look at my tip, look at how blunt that tip is. I love it when my tip is blunt like that, because I'm not focused on little details. I'm just getting in here and I'm sketching, I'm having fun, I'm getting really loose lines on part of my drawing. Draw through your shape to figure out those curves. So I'm putting some detail on top of that chest of that wrapping over. And if it gets to be too blunt, you come back then with one of your sharper edges and you come back here and then you can draw that little corner because you're going to have that wrapping over. So you're going to be able to see that. And then also I want to add, I wish I could zoom in on this camera, but I can't right now. I want to add that little ledge right there. So I have that outside line and that little inside line that wraps over right there. So that way, and if you don't have straight as a line, 
or hand, excuse me, you can take your trusty handy dandy ruler and you could come over here. And I like to wiggle my ruler a little bit when I draw so the line doesn't look nearly as straight because when it's straight, it doesn't look real, right? So you can see, look at that. So I already have the top part coming in. So I come in here and now I'm thinking I'm gonna have some type of a lock mechanism. So let's find the middle. How do I find the middle, right? I come over here, I cross. I cross on that square, I bring a line down, boom. That's the middle. So if I bring a line up here, it's gonna hit about there. So I know about right here. I was thinking there'd be some type of a round lock mechanism. That's right in here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little bit of a base to it to give it a little bit of thickness. And then I'm gonna drop a center line. I'm gonna to try to protrude it out a little bit because I had this goofy idea that maybe what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna erase a little bit of that in there because this is forgiving, see that? Just erased right up. If that doesn't work, you can then come back over here and take your eraser like so. And what I wanted to do, find the center line for that, bring that line out because then I had the thought of what if I had like a skull eye here and then I had some type of nose and I had little, like little teeth back in here and it looked like there's some type of a skull on this. So I might see part of that other eye like that. And then there might be a little bit of a metal detail around that. And then maybe the, the lower jaw sort of comes like this and hangs down like so, okay? So it doesn't quite, it's all right for right now. And there's my rough skull in front of it. To get the skull, you really need to have that side uh, like temporalis, the fascia bone right there connected off the side of the, the chin anyway, but that's fine for my rough comp. So I'm going to come back in here. I want to put a little bit, I like on chess sometimes that they have these pieces of metal that come on the end like this. And they're sort of decorative end keepers. So I sort of measure that distance from right here going across over to there, you know, and eyeball some of that and then put a little bit of a rounded curve on some of that. Come back and do the same thing back here. And I even try to break it up a little bit so it looks a little bit more used and beat up, you know? This is an old, thinking of having like an old style treasure chest, you know? Okay. the middle, right? It's important to know that center line. There we go. Get that in there. Let's get an inlay in here. So there's that top. So I had a little bit of overlap right here. From a previous line, I'm going to erase some of that. And then I'm going to see down on top of that inlay right there. So there might be a hinge on the back here. Might put a little bit of uh, here. I I just realized now as I'm looking at this, one of the things I hate about drawing and lecturing is I don't stay as focused. This needs to be over a little bit more. I made it a little bit too much right there, but that's all right. Actually, I ended that line. A little bit too soon it should be back a little bit more but this is my rough right i can fix those problems you know the whole purpose of this is for me to show this and get this approved so i can move on to another idea or concept little metal studs maybe there's one there there's one down there and then maybe there's a couple old pieces of wood some line of the wood okay all right and Put an inlay in this one. Gonna be able to see on top of that. All right, so to me, that's that's fine. That's my rough little comp right there, right? Because now, look, if I could, let's just take a look. Let's say I'm done with my comp, and then here's something I also wanted to mention to you guys. What do you do when your tracing paper is done like this? So your rough sketch is on there. You show it, you get your work approved, right? Um, this is gonna start to buckle. Look, it already wants to start rolling. It's gonna pick up the humidity in the air. 
and the wetness, and it's going to do that. It's going to buckle. Aha! What's the solution? You take a piece of cheap 11 by 17 paper or legal sized paper, you take your tracing paper, you put it on top like this, and then you tape down one corner and you tape down the other corner. Okay, it's still fine. Then when I go to clean this up, I put another piece of tracing paper on it and it's just fine, okay? All right, so with that in mind, let's do uh, another couple props here, but let's even go quicker because let's, I'm gonna leave myself a, a smaller time minute gap here and let's do, uh, let's pretend we have a couple bags, okay? So maybe we have some older bags. Now, when I draw like this, the other way I like to draw like this is like this with an angled tip because it's nice and it's very loose and very soft. And actually there's a lot of artists that use this for figure drawing quite a bit because you can get in there and get a nice like angled gradient mass like that, you see that? So that can help show part of a nice part of like the figure or a muscle or whatever. So this is a great way to sketch as well, you know? So here I'm just comping out maybe one of my props on my prop list was a couple bags of money. So I might come in here and have that sort of bag there. Maybe there's an old label or something on top of it. I don't know. I'm just making this up. I just doing this out of my head really quick. And then I might come over here. There might be another bag with another bag lying in front of that. Maybe this bag is supposed to be open, let's say. Whatever your prop list calls for, you know, you're working on a show and you have a production manager or assistant who's going to come over and they're going to give, maybe they want to see little pieces of gold in here. Maybe it calls for that on the prop list. Okay. So maybe your bag, you can see it open a little bit. Okay. This is actually when I work on environments. Another time when I have more time, I can do a demo on environments like this. I really love this. It's really fun. Can you see how nice and soft that is already? Gosh, it's just so gosh darn forgiving and it's so much fun. On the rope, make sure the rope looks correct. Ah, all right. See how easy it is. See how you can come back and get that nice shiny line on it because you're getting a really nice pointy tip on that pencil because you're dragging with that pencil sideways for so long. Maybe this one has a tear in it. Actually, maybe it has like a stitch, right? It's been stitched in. And then here, I don't know, I'm just making it up. Maybe they call for, there should be a tear in the bag and there should be pieces of gold coming out. Okay, there it is. That's pretty rough, right? Look at how much fun it is. So, I mean, you just got to get in there and just have, you know, fun with this. It's such a great medium. So let's, the next one, let's do a book with a skull on it. Now you look, I'm already getting that bend and it's already going to drive me nuts. So what I'm going to do, is I'm going to pull out my trusty little piece of paper here. And let me stand up and get a couple pieces of tape. Now, this tape I'm going to use is just a standard base. Hold on. One, two, three. This is a white, opaque, oops, green labeled scotch tape. That's all it is. Simple and it's easy. Okay. So I'm going to come over here. Now you'll notice I have a little bit of border, so I keep a little bit of border on my image. I go like that. I take my tape. Try to keep your tape just on a little bit on the tracing paper, more on the paper itself, because the scotch tape does have a tendency to pick up uh, the dirtiness of your fingers and so on, and that can be a little bit annoying. And tear that piece in two like that, 
put a little bit on that edge right here. So when I go to scan that, you see that? I have my dirty fingerprint in there. It's going to pick that up. But that's okay. Because remember, I'm not going to scan this, am I? No. This is my rough. So since it's my rough, this is my first pass at my props. This might be something I might show or scan in and then clean up on top of, right? I've done this pretty quick. Okay, there it is. Look at it now. Freedom. See, it's taped down. Okay, I even like to tape once in the middle here and there. So I don't, I'll hit it with my fingers and knock it up. But I'm going to do that a little bit later. So let me get the book in here. I have an edge cover to my book right there. And then my pa the pages are a little bit recessed. Okay, now I'm going to flip my pencil up just a little bit more. Get a little bit darker line on here. And as I get this line in here, I can do this and then get this little detail here for that edge. Thick and thin. And just sort of do this. Okay, there it is. It's the base of my paper. Now I notice I have this little over line right there. I'm going to erase some of that real quick. Let's get a skull in there fast. So I'm not looking at any reference here. And imagine there's my skull. There's a the base of my skull. Let's come up. Let's get my skull to be about here. Let's say I haven't drawn skulls for a little while. So once I know where my skull is going to be, I'm just going to lightly just very quickly go over that line there and then go over there. That's all right. Remember, this is rough, right? So what do I remember about skulls? I remember I had this, I had that. Comes around to the front here. I have a center line. I have my nose usually here. And then I have my one of my sockets here. You have that little bit of a brown line sometimes when that comes in there. Then you have part of the teeth come forward after that bone though they sort of curve in a little bit like this okay so there's the base of my skull yeah I can spend a good day drawing some skulls I haven't done them for a while okay there we go and then let's do the base so you know you have a down here I forget that little extension that comes out like this in here and part of your jaw hooks up and then your jaw bone sort of comes down and basically your jaw comes down and wraps when you come up here you have like the back teeth this is where I might need some reference just to make sure it's a little bit more accurate okay and you all do this because we do this as one of the props for my prop class. Maybe there's a candle on this guy's head. I can do the flame. Not an effects animator. So that was an accident when I came here. And there I put that little part on there. Okay. That's the wick. All right. All right, so look, that prop's done. There's a label. On it like so. Okay, now, here's what I love about this technique so much. If I was in a super duper hero, uh, excuse me, sorry, I'm too busy talking. If I was in a super duper hurry, not hero, can't talk right now, too busy focusing on this thing. What I could do is I could lightly come in, and this is great for the value studies. Watch, I can smear that and go, that's going to be shadow. So whenever I want to hit shadow, I'm going to smear it with my pencil right now. I'm going to have light coming this way. So that's going to be light. That's going to be light. This is going to be more shadow. That's going to be more shadow. And maybe there's even a little bit of a drop shadow under there. And that drop shadow is going to continue forward on the book a little bit here. Okay, and then I'm going to have... A little bit of shadow in between the binding ledge there where it drops down and indents and then maybe on back of this page right here real quick now for my class I'm not asking you to do this right now we do this later right now we're just going in and I'm doing this real quick to show you the value of this medium and how quick it is okay so look I'm gonna put a little bit there 
on that, a little bit on there. And then I'm going to come in lightly and put some more, just very light value on the rest of the book. Now it's important for me when I smear the rest of that light value, I'm going with the grain or the flow. So you see this, I'm going this way, which is the curve of the book. Don't go straight across, it'll flatten out the book. I'm going with part of the flow of the surface, okay? A little bit more there, a little bit there, let's say. And maybe I'll come over here and do this one as well too. So that's gonna be shadow side, let's say right in here. This is if I'm asked to do this. A lot of times I don't. I just do the rough and go over it real quick. But sometimes, just depending on who you're working for, sometimes you like seeing little bits of value on your drawings. It's totally fine. Good. There we go. So I smudge a little here. There. All right. And then voila, here comes the magic part, right? You take a trusty done Kleenex. Come over. Boom, look at how dark that got. See that? Oh, it's so quick. It's just like magic happening on the paper. Look at that. And then you could come over and I can lightly, I can just depending on how hard I want to press that down, I can lightly blend it in or I can really get in there and just like really just press down on it pretty hard, you know? Just really get in there and like, Ugh. maybe in here it's a lot darker. Let's say like that in the front. Right there. Now, personally, I don't like doing that with the white background. If I do this, I smudge the whole paper or a big block of it because I don't like having just that item smudged. Oops, there's my other eraser. Take my pentel. Get rid of this right there. Okay. But now I'm noticing, look, I'm not working with a glove on. See that black getting on my finger? I'm smearing it everywhere. This technique can be really dirty. So I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to form fit my awesome kneaded eraser by pinching it like that, creating a wedge on it. I'm going to come back in here. It's going to take me a whopping like two minutes just to get in here and clean this up. If you don't do this, I have a couple students that do this all the time. They get very dirty. Look at that. I have a nice clean white edge there. So it's important for me to come in and get these edges nice and crisp and get some of that dirtiness away from it. Okay. Now that that's done, you know, and I have it smudged, you'll notice what it's done is it's pushed down part of my line values. My The darkness of my line is in this dark. Okay. That's all right. This is where you get to come in now and you get to punch it back up and you get to push and pull with shapes. So this is how we push and pull the shapes right now. Okay. Won't be as noticeable with the white all around it, but we'll just give it a quick pass. So this is what I do. If I come in here and I take my little, sorry, where to go? Oh, there it is. I take my little eraser. See if I come over here and I punch and I erase a little bit there on the tip of that. See that highlight in there? That's the magic that happens. And then if I come along here and I can start to pull out some little highlights very efficiently. Do you see that? I'm just touching along a couple different areas. So I know part of that bone right here is going to hit it. Going over that eye a little like that. Look, I can even put the wedge shape down and lightly create a gradient blend with my eraser. Do you see how I did that? How efficient that is? Look, I can come back here on the teeth, pick out a couple different teeth. Look at that. That's badass, right? That's bitching. Sorry, I shouldn't swear like that. I'll get in trouble. Being So then what I'm going to start to do is look what happens when I come in with my darker line. So this is with the pushing and the pulling. To pull something forward towards me, I put a nice crisp highlight on it, like so. See that highlight? Then if I want to come in here and push that area down, I just come in here on the teeth and part of the jaw and I darken that down. Look at that. That's what's so wonderful about this and that's why it's such an efficient technique is now I could come in here and really just 
See that? Hit part of that. And they're like that. And then I come back with trusty. Now, some of you, I don't have them here. Let me see if I do. I was going to show you a stump. Actually, I do. I'm sorry. I'm knocking stuff over in my art desk. Give me one minute. I'm going to grab a sample of a stump. I had it tucked away in my bag. And here's my stump. Aha. You'll notice black line, blue line. I only use this one for blue. I only use that one for black. So when I'm working here right now, I can get in there. See, if I smudge that with my Kleenex, that's all going to smudge in there. So I just hit it really quick like this. I get some nice little darks in there. See that? Boom, really nice values. So I come back again, take my pencil, come over here. This is where the pencil's on its side. I get this really nice sort of gradient push like that coming across. Okay, I get that. So now I'm going to come in here and just sort of define little areas. I might have a little shadow, cast off this way. I have, I'm going to get in here, get a little thick and thin contour line going on part of that skull right there. And then I have part of this inside here. That's going to be in shadow. So if this is hit by light, this will be darker in right here. This is how you can start using this tool to render very efficiently. Easy way. And here's the thing. If you're looking at your highlights and you feel like you've hit them too much, you just take them back down. This is all you got to do to take them down. You come back and you rub on top of them. Look at what happens. See that? I just push the highlights back down. So if I, I look at this and I'm like, oh, look, I forgot a tooth in there. No worry. Take your handy dandy eraser. Boom. 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 Put a couple teeth in there. See that? It's instantaneous. It's such a great technique. Look at that. Look at those highlights in there. Now it's all about pushing and pulling and knowing what lines to darken, what lines to leave alone. If I darken too much, if I darken the whole thing, it'll kill it. So I gotta get in here and think about some of that, you know? Let's say right here on this tip, I have a little bit of highlight. A little bit of reflective light back on that edge right there. Okay. I never finished these teeth in here, sorry. I get too caught up I'm starting to render a little bit here, having fun, okay? Get that nose in there. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this? I mean, I could really get in now. I could spend 20, 30 minutes on this and really get some nice rendering effects starting to happen. And that's why this technique is so valuable. And that's why so many artists love it. They work in animation, uh, in the animation industry. So I can use it for character design. I can push and pull. I'm doing this really quick in a demo. And like I told you guys before, I hate talking when I'm drawing, but I had to try to get this out in a quicker time because um, I got to go back and take care of some family matters tonight. So there, let me get that out. Now I'm going to make, maybe I put some like stitching over part of my book. Maybe my book has these like ends that are a darker leather. There, get that on there. Take your, take your stump or your Kleenex. Smudge it in a little bit more. You know, whatever you want to do, you want to get a label in here, you just come in here, you push it down a little bit more. Maybe there's old signature and an old, like, it's just filling the space, you know? Like that, I get some of that. A little bit of shadow on that. A little bit of shadow value coming up. Like that, and that's it. Leave it alone. So, I'm just mentioning that. You don't have to go in and render, but I'm just showing you why people use this technique. And here's the greatest thing, right? Let's say you're working on the skull and they're like, oh, we want to crack in the skull. You're like, all right. Look, I just went down to the pure white of the paper. I don't know many other techniques that you can do that with. Right? So I could be working on this showing something to my director and he can like totally change something and I can look I can put a huge crack in something and maybe I get back here and they're like yeah show the back side so I lightly put a little bit of line in there I come over here I smudge it in bam 
take my little eraser, take this nice wedge tip here, clean up along that edge a little bit there. Okay, don't do that. That's a habit. Do that. That won't smear it. Okay. Now, what I like to do is when I'm working on this, I have to walk away. Because if I will over render and kill something because I'm not looking at it and my eyes get used to it. That's a common thing that happens with big, with artists. Not just, I was going to say beginning artists, but actually it doesn't happen with beginning artists. Because it's something I still do in Photoshop. And it's something that I do when I'm working all the time. You have to learn to walk away from your artwork to know when it's working, when it's not working. I'm darkening different parts of the contour line here because it acts as an anchoring shadow point to hold that book down. I'm going to come here, darken part of that. Need to bring that label off a little bit more. Like so. There we go. All right. Look at that. Cool. I'm not even looking at reference. I'm just throwing stuff out of my brain right now, you know? That's the cool thing about some of this is you just take with what you know, see where it, it takes you. Now I want to come in here. I want to make this book look like old and raggedy a little bit. So I'm going to do that by pushing and pulling value. So look, I'll come in here and I'll throw some spots on it. See, I highlight that little area like that. Put a little area here. A little something there, a little something there. Okay, see how that makes it look a little old? And I want to smudge it down a little bit, so I take my trusty little Kleenex, put it down. Make sure your finger isn't going through the Kleenex either. If your finger's doing that, it's not going to work. You're now smudging it with your... There. Okay, and I haven't even put any highlights yet. I can come back to my book and say, hey, I want a little bit of a highlight here. I want a little bit of something going sort of that way. What about the edge of that binding wrapping over? Maybe there's just a little bit to separate that plane there. As it sort of goes across, right? And then if that's where, if I need to, I take my little eraser here. Get a nice crisp line in there. Then I can push down that edge of the cut of the, the, the book back. Excuse me. That. Right. There it is. So have fun with it. You know, get in there, rough it out. Don't be afraid of it. Let's see what happens. If you want to smudge something, go for it. See what it looks like. You want to try to render it, go for it. We're not going to do that right now until we get to the finish, the finished piece. Our job right now is to create a bunch of props that look really co cool. Now, when I do my props, any client that I'm working for, I always smudge something like this because I want them to see the overall shape language of the prop. I want them to tell if the prop is interesting or not. And so I'm not really concerned about detail as much as I am having a value that's in there. So if I was... Hold on, I dropped something. If I was working for, if this was a real piece for somebody and I was doing a whole bunch of props that were going to tie into an environment and I want to get my props approved first, that's it. This is what I would do. I might even come over here and do the same thing. Now, if I smudge those bags, what's going to happen where there's no light in there, it's going to be very, very light. So what I need to do is come over here, darken that down a little bit more, lightly go over this. Push that, get that down. So now I take this, trust to clean X. Pressing a little harder on that bag back here because it's in between. You can learn where you just lightly press down. Like here, I'm very lightly pressing down. You can see how the gradient value is just so much lighter. Okay. So once again, to my my environment, uh, excuse me, environments, I can't talk because uh, I'm drawing. That's why I'm only good at focusing on one thing usually. So 
to my students in basic drawing for entertainment arts, this you don't have to tone again. Your job is just to get in there and rough sketch and then put another later on after we approve it and talk about working on the props or making them better. There, now I can come back and thicken thin that line a little bit. A little bit more information in there, get that bag to pop a little. I can pick corners that I want. such fun. So imagine if I'm having fun doing this on props, imagine how fun this is on people sketching the clothed figure and, you know, sketching someone at Starbucks, right? That's where it gets fun. Now what about animals? Yeah, going to the zoo, sketching. Heck yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So again, now it's time to clean up a little bit. So I take this my little Pentel eraser here, it works pretty good. Also going to take my wonderful kneaded eraser, works just as well. I have smudges here, I'm going to come along here, hit that. Because I have a couple students that are what I call messy Marvins, and they don't believe in the power of the kneaded eraser. So I want to show you how efficient it is. Look at that. Boom, right down to the white. It's right there. It's all cleaned up. Quite fantastic. In fact, you start looking at it, and you know, if this was an assignment, boom, I could scan that right now and send that to my art director and label this rough comps. All I gotta do is tone those really quick, but I'm gonna stop right now for the lecture's sake because um, I need to go render this and then go take care of some other things. So I'm gonna wrap it up and say thanks for watching, have fun, and um, stay rough with it because remember, my goal at the very end of this, hold on, what I do with it? I set it down. Sorry. Remember, that was my other rough I did before. And once I put a piece of white paper on that drawing, so I'm going to flip this over and show you, that's what that rough was, right? And pretty rough. And then look at the beautiful line drawing. So we want to get to this beautiful line drawing phase. So I, that's why I don't care if you guys render right now. Um, if I have a page of props like this done with line consistency like that, whether I've done it traditionally, as long as I can mimic that in Photoshop or Illustrator, I can get job as a prop designer. That's what prop designers do, and there's always a need for good prop designers. Okay? All right, so I'm going to flip it back over. Go get to it. Go have fun, and we'll see you soon. Bye, guys.